In this video we'll discuss angina. We'll go through an introduction, the symptoms associated with it. The three types of angina. Then finally an introduction to the drugs used for it. The heart, is just like any other organ in the body, it needs blood supply, oxygen and nutrients to work properly. And this is done through the coronary arteries. So, what happens if any of the coronary arteries get blocked for some reason? Then the heart won't have sufficient blood supply and oxygen, and that's simply what causes angina. So what happens when the heart doesn't receive enough blood? That leads us to the symptoms of angina. Typical angina pectoris is a characteristic sudden, severe, crushing chest pain that may radiate to the jaw and neck, back and arms. Patients may also suffer from difficulty breathing, or atypical symptoms such as indigestion, nausea, vomiting, or sweating. Angina is classified to three types according to the type of blockade and blood perfusion, and duration of symptoms. And the three types are, stable, unstable and variant angina. So, what can block the coronary arteries? Coronary arteries may be blocked by plaques or spasm. Let me explain. If excessive amounts of fat, circulating the blood, fatty deposits, called plaques, can accumulate in the arteries. This buildup is called atherosclerosis, causes the vessels to narrow, or become obstructed. So tissues of the heart starve, for oxygen supply. This type of blockade involved in the stable and unstable angina. Stable angina is the most common form of angina, so it is also called classic or typical angina pectoris. It is caused by the reduction of coronary perfusion, due to a fixed obstruction of a coronary artery produced by atherosclerosis. In normal conditions and resting state, the blood passing from the unblocked part of the coronary arteries is sufficient for the heart to work properly. But once there is an increased demand for blood, such as during exercise, stressful conditions or excitement, the heart becomes vulnerable to ischemia, which is simply heart's tissues starve for oxygen. But no myocardial infarction occurs, that means tissues don't die. That's why stable angina is also known as effort-induced angina. Typical angina pectoris is promptly relieved, by rest, or nitroglycerin. In unstable angina, chest pain may occur during rest. It occurs with increased frequency, duration, and intensity. Any episode of rest angina longer than 20 minutes, any new onset angina, any increasing angina, or even sudden development of shortness of breath is suggestive of unstable angina. The symptoms are not relieved by rest or nitroglycerin. Unstable angina is a form of acute coronary syndrome, which can result from rupture of an atherosclerotic plaque, and partial or complete thrombosis of a coronary artery. Let me explain. Most cases occur from disruption of an atherosclerotic lesion, followed by platelet activation of the coagulation cascade. That will result in partial or complete occlusion. So if this occlusion is untreated, necrosis, Myocardial infarction of the cardiac muscle may occur. So it's an emergency situation that requires hospital admission and more aggressive therapy to prevent progression to myocardial infarction and death. We said that coronary arteries may be blocked by plaques or spasms. So the third type of angina is variant angina, also known as prinzmetal, vasospastic, or rest angina. It is an uncommon pattern of episodic angina, that occurs at rest, and is due to coronary artery spasm. So symptoms are caused by decreased blood flow to the myocardium, from the spasm of the coronary artery. Although patients suffering from this type of angina, may also have coronary atherosclerosis, the angina attacks aren't related to physical activity, heart rate, or blood pressure. Variant angina generally responds promptly to coronary vasodilators, such as nitroglycerin and calcium channel blockers. So let's make it clear. Unstable and variant angina may occur at rest, while stable angina occurs at exercise. 
stable and variant angina respond to medication, while unstable angina doesn't respond to medication and requires hospitalization. So, finally let's outline the treatment of angina. To manage the symptoms of angina, we need drugs that help to balance the cardiac oxygen supply and demand. And this is done by affecting blood pressure, venous return, heart rate, and contractility. So there are four types of drugs that can do that, when given alone or in combination. Beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, organic nitrates, and the sodium channel blocking drug, renalazine. We said that to manage the symptoms of angina, we need drugs that help to balance the cardiac oxygen supply and demand. And this is done by affecting blood pressure, venous return, heart rate, and contractility. And we said there are four types of drugs that can do that, when given alone or in combination. Beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, organic nitrates, and the sodium channel blocking drug, renalazine. Let's first start by beta blockers. They act by blocking beta-1 receptors, resulting in decreased heart rate, contractility, cardiac output and blood pressure. So they decrease the oxygen demand of the myocardium, during exertion and at rest. So, what beta blockers can do, is that they can reduce both the frequency and severity of angina attacks. And they can be used to increase exercise duration and tolerance, in patients with effort-induced angina. They also reduce the risk of death and myocardial infarction, in patients who have had a prior myocardial infarction and also improve mortality, in patients with hypertension, and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Propranolol is the prototype for beta blockers, but it is not cardioselective. As we already know that the non-selective beta blockers, block beta-1 receptors in the heart, so they decrease the heart rate, as well as blocking beta-2 receptors in the lungs, causing bronchospasm. For further information feel free to watch Beta Blockers lecture, the link will be down in the description. So, other selective Beta-1 blockers, such as Metoprolol and Atenolol, are preferred. Non-selective Beta Blockers should be avoided in patients with severe bradycardia, and in patients with asthma. However, selective Beta-1 blockers can be used in patients with diabetes, peripheral vascular disease and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, as long as they are monitored closely. Because all beta blockers are non-selective at high doses and can inhibit beta-2 receptors, you should know that beta blocker therapy shouldn't be suddenly stopped. The dose should be gradually tapered off, over 2-3 to three weeks, to avoid rebound angina, myocardial infarction, and hypertension. Calcium channel blockers used for angina are divided into two groups, dihydropyridines and non-dihydropyridines. Dihydropyridines, such as amlodipine and nifedipine, they act mainly as arteriolar vasodilators. They has minimal effect on cardiac conduction. The vasodilatory effect of amlodipine is useful in the treatment of variant angina caused by spontaneous coronary spasm. Nifedipine is usually administered as an extended release, oral formulation. Non-dihydropyridines, such as verapamil and diltiazem. Verapamil, slows atrioventricular conduction directly and decreases heart rate, contractility, blood pressure and oxygen demand. It has greater negative inotropic effects than amlodipine, but it is a weaker vasodilator. It is contraindicated in patients with pre-existing depressed cardiac function, or AV conduction abnormalities. Diltiazem also slows AV conduction, decreases the rate of firing of the sinus node pacemaker, and is also a coronary artery vasodilator. It can relieve coronary artery spasm, and is particularly useful in patients with variant angina. This category of drugs should be avoided in heart failure as they can worsen the case, due to their negative and entropic effect. These drugs relieve symptoms by reducing myocardial oxygen demand, and they are effective in stable, 
unstable and variant angina. So, what is the exact mechanism? Organic nitrates relax vascular smooth muscle. By their intracellular conversion to nitrite ions, and then to nitric oxide, which activates guanylate cyclase and increases the cell's cyclic guanosine monophosphate, CGMP. Elevated CGMP causes dephosphorylation of the myosin light chain, resulting in vascular smooth muscle relaxation. Then CGMP is degraded and inactivated by phosphodiesterase type 5. And this terminates the action of nitric oxide. Nitrates cause dilation of the large veins, which reduces preload, venous return to the heart, and this reduces the work of the heart. And they also dilate the coronary arteries, increasing blood supply to the myocardium. There are three drugs in this class we should talk about. Nitrates differ in their onset of action and rate of elimination. The onset of action varies from 1 minute for nitroglycerin, to 30 minutes for isosorbide mononitrate. So, for an immediate relief of an acute angina attack, precipitated by exercise or emotional stress, sublingual nitroglycerin is the drug of choice. So it's very important for everyone suffers from angina, to have nitroglycerin tablets in their pockets for acute attacks. Significant first pass metabolism of nitroglycerin occurs in the liver. So, to avoid the hepatic first pass effect, it's commonly administered via the sublingual, or transdermal route, as a patch or an ointment. Isosorbide mononitrate is stable against hepatic breakdown, so it has an improved bioavailability and long duration of action. Oral isosorbide dinitrate undergoes denitration to two mononitrates. Now let's talk about side effects, contraindications and precautions of this class. First, headache is the most common adverse effect of nitrates. And high doses can also cause postural hypotension, facial flushing and tachycardia. Phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors such as sildenafil, potentiate the action of the nitrates as they inhibit the enzyme that deactivates CGMP. So this combination is contraindicated. Tolerance to the actions of nitrates develops rapidly as the blood vessels become desensitized to vasodilation. And this can be overcome by providing a daily nitrate-free interval to restore sensitivity to the drug. For example, nitroglycerin patches are worn for 12 hours and then removed for 12 hours. And finally let's talk about the sodium channel blocker, renalazine. It improves the oxygen supply and demand equation. It inhibits the late phase of the sodium current, and this reduces intracellular sodium and calcium overload, thereby improving diastolic function. Renalazine can be used for angina, and it also has antiarrhythmic properties. It is indicated for the treatment of chronic angina, and may be used alone or in combination with other traditional therapies. That's all for this lecture. In the next lecture we'll start discussing blood disorders, and anticoagulants and antiplatelet agents. So subscribe and wait for the next lecture.